so I lived near a ghost town in Elvira, Pennsylvania. Back during World War II, the government claimed eminent domain and booted everyone out, then built a munitions and bomb factory. Fast forward to now, a chunk of land was given back to the community as state game land. A portion of it hosts a federal prison, and a bunch of it sits unused by the government itself. The game land contains the remnants of the town, which is just foundations and wells at this big point, and a bunch of bunkers. These bunkers are concrete igloo-like structures, with a big metal door on one side, once used to store explosives. Now, used for teens to get drunk and do drugs inside. Over time, they've become covered in dirt and plant growth, so you might mistake it for a hill if you didn't see the door. There are local rumors that devil worshippers hang out in the game lands and have strange rituals in the forest and in some of the more out of the way bunkers. Me personally, I never believe these. Every single town has a place with devil worshipper rumors. But last year, my friend claimed that it was actually true. He said his parents were hunting that fall, saw a group of people in robes around a fire, chanting. A figure wearing a deer head mask stood in the center of them. His parents hunkered down and kept eye on that ceremony, kind of in a daze like state from the whole spectacle of it. Maybe it was a movie set or a weird old religious practice. They said that they only stuck around because they were sure some reasonable explanation would present itself, but none ever did. As they watched the entire situation continue to devolve, the chanting grew into a roar and the choir slowly began to disrobe before the masked stranger. The very first to get naked took handfuls of some substance from a large bowl and started to paint the deer mask figure around his neck. Only then did they realize it wasn't a mask at all, but a real deer head, hauled out and still dripping with gore. The stuff they were palming out of the bowl looked to be blood. Without a word, my friend's parents started to backpedal and get the hell out of there. As they did, one of them took a bad step and crunched on some underbrush. They said the entire cold stopped and then turned in their direction and began wailing and moving all kinds of crazy. They used the darkness to their advantage as well as their camouflage and charged through the forest in the direction of their truck. After running for a few minutes, they finally turned to look back. In the distance, they could see a fire glowing between the trees and slender figures chasing them in the moonlight. They weren't as quick since they were naked, but still, they were putting some ground behind them. Only the guy with the deer head mask remained by the fire, his creepy arms extended up in the air. My friend's dad said the guy's arms looked like they were eight feet long, but, but he was sure it was some sort of illusion from the firelight. He also said, one time while him and his dad were scouting, he heard the chanting and singing and then saw smoke coming out of the trees. This time it was earlier in the afternoon, so they still had some daylight to investigate. My buddy said his dad turned him with the most serious look and asked, you want to see something crazy? Of course my friend said yes. They're dressed appropriately, they know the area, even have sidearms. There couldn't be a better time to go check something like this out. Even with that perfect opportunity at hand, my friend told me as they got closer to the singing, he got a sick feeling in his stomach. He realized, no, he didn't want to see whatever was going on behind that tree line. He said it was the most unnatural thing he could imagine out there, and the fact that they were drawn to it was a huge red flag in his mind. He compared it to being in a haunted house. If you heard someone screaming bloody murder in one of the rooms down the hall, you would probably run the opposite direction. So why was it that they were hearing something out of place in an area known for Satanists and they were pulled toward the sound rather than driven off? It was almost like a fight or flight trigger had clicked in his head and he felt like they were making a giant mistake. My friend expressed this to his father, who he turned to find was ghastly white. His dad said he didn't feel up to it either, so they turned around and made for the truck. That chanting never faded, but only seemed to get louder as they got further away. He also said there was a vile smell in the air that seemed to be riding the smoke cloud, as if they were burning roadkill or something. Personally, I never believed this story, not even when I heard it. It sounded too perfect, so I just figured they wanted to come up with something to mess with us kids. To be fair, it was a good attempt. That's not the kind of story you just forget about. 
Most of our group were constantly talking about it, half obsessed with the notion of a cult just outside of our town. It wasn't long before we started planning little explorations of our own into the ghost town of Alvira. Now for my own experience. When I was in high school, myself and about five friends were all having an all-nighter at my house in the summer, playing manhunt in the woods, shooting each other with airsoft guns, the usual stuff. At night, we all went out with flashlights into the woods because of course we did. The woods around my house are the same woods as the game lands. There are only two properties between mine and where the bunkers begin. We saw an orange light through the woods, except it was in the wrong direction for any neighbor. There weren't any buildings in the direction of that light. Slowly, almost one by one, we all stopped playing and became transfixed on that glow. Is it a car, a bonfire? Then the smell hit us. That same awful smell my friend had described from a year before. Like smoldering flesh, burning hair. It's honestly unmistakable. We've all driven by a dump. We've smelled gases and mountains of rotting trash. But this smell was far worse. I have no idea what it was, but I can for sure tell you that it was dead. My friends claimed it was the devil worshippers, and then all started to freak out. As I said, I didn't believe in those stories, but I played along to scare everyone. Little did my buddy know that I was just playing around, assuming we'd find something normal just a few hundred yards into the forest. Like I said, there were some properties between my house and where those bunkers began, but they didn't have houses on them. Both acreages were used for logging, hunting, and camping, and all manner of outdoor recreation. I figured one of the property owners was having a family reunion or something like that. So we all went out on a quest to find the devil worshippers and went toward that light. There was an overgrown road that led into the forest, but then tapered off into a pretty clean path. We walked in a little cluster, with those on the outer ring warding off the dark with a couple of flashlights. A couple of us had the airsoft guns, which might look real in the shadows, but ultimately wouldn't protect us from anything. The light drifted off to our right now, away from the trail. We left the path and began bushwhacking in the dark, now quite far from the house. I couldn't even see the back porch light through the forest anymore, so it had to be at least a mile away. Whatever the orange glow was, it lured us much deeper than I anticipated. We heard my neighbor's dog in the distance, barking its head off. Assumed it was at us, but then it got really intense. Made a horrifying noise no dog should be making, and then just stopped. We were all a bit taken back by that noise, so we stopped and listened. In the dark, from just beyond the reach of our light, we hear footsteps. Bipedal sounding footsteps. Not a squirrel in the brush or a deer crashing through bushes, but a clear crunch, 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 crunch of the leaves. My buddy and I point the airsoft guns into the tree, start spraying in every direction. After a few seconds, we stop again and just listen. There's nothing except the occasional set of steps through the leaves. Sometimes they're close. Other times they sound really far off, like the person is leaving. We didn't really know what to do. It felt like we were trapped. After five minutes or so, the footsteps stop altogether, and there's nothing to be heard. At that point, we all unanimously decide to head back. My friend and I wanted to keep going, though, but we didn't want to do it alone, so we all agreed. We were sleeping in the guest apartment over the garage, which is a separate building from our house. It has one of those 70s accordion-style doors halfway up the stairs, separating the upstairs area from the hallway and bathroom downstairs. We kept it shut to keep the warm air trapped upstairs with us, but also as a layer of security. It had a little latch to be locked to give us an extra second in the event someone actually came for us. We talked about the cult, that light we saw, and the crazy sounds that we heard. It was heart pounding for the first 15 minutes, but as the night went on, nothing else happened. The rest of the group slowly began to lose interest. Later that night, well after midnight, when we were settled in and starting to doze off, those of us who were still awake heard something brush against the door from the other side. It was a flimsy plastic linoleum thing, so it was moving as something had bumped it. We could hear the noise clearly. I gathered up the courage to say out loud, 
Does anyone hear something bumping the door? I got a few shaky yeses from around the room. Is anyone going to get up and check it out? Now I heard several nopes from the others, as I sure as hell wasn't going to do it. It went away a few minutes later. I got up a bit creeped out and went down the stairs. I could see that flimsy accordion door was still latched in place, but it looked like it had been pushed inward. I took my finger and dragged it back and forth along the folds of the door. It sounded exactly like what we heard earlier. I went back up as quietly as I could, told the others about my little discovery. Just as I'm talking, a weird shadow passes over the room. There's only a few of us awake now, and we can see each other in what little moonlight can make it through that big panel window. All of us reacted to it, so we knew whatever we saw had to be something real. Slowly, trembling, we turn to look at the window. Right there in the middle of the pane is the longest arm I've ever seen with this gnarled, twisted hand right in front of the glass. Like I said, we were on the second floor above the garage, so for someone to raise their arm up, it'd have to be 15 feet long. The fingers alone were 12 or 10 inches. We watch in horror as it rears back and then begins tapping against the glass. It starts quietly, but with each rap, it gets a bit louder. Those of us that are awake hit the floor. I remember being in such a panic that I couldn't even breathe, feeling as if we were about to be drowned on the carpet floor. Some of the others started to cry into their pillows. I watched the arm bang against the glass when I realized that wasn't a hand, but a knot of sticks. The arm itself was a branch, but all of it had been shaved to look like a limb with fingers at the end. In the dark shadows with our already panicked minds, it was easy to see it for something else. It was a bit of a relief to see that there wasn't a 20 foot tall man standing outside the apartment, but still, someone was out there banging around. After a few minutes, the branch slowly sank back into the shadows below the window. As it did, we heard the rustling against the linoleum door halfway down the stairs. This time it wasn't just scraping against the plastic. Someone was really trying to yank open that door. I could even hear footsteps shuffling on the level below. Someone was inside the garage. We all went into a meltdown at this point. A few of us decided it was our last stand. We grabbed some various items in the apartment, like a hammer and a 2 by 4 and lined up at the top of the stairs. We all played airsoft, so we thought we knew basic tactics. Cut them off with the bottleneck was the only logical defense. If they got into the landing with us, we're dead. I remember that charred smell from the woods and realized we could all be burned alive. But just like that branch in the window, the rustling against the door stopped too. We heard the footsteps retreat until they went back outside. By then, we were all far too scared to get to the window to look. None of us could breathe. After what seemed like an hour or two of silence, we packed up our stuff and made a live flight into the main house all of us at a full sprint. Nothing came out to grab us though. When I turned to close and lock the door behind us, I saw that same glow out in the trees. It was a bright orange fire, warding off the dark. I bet if I listened, I could still hear them singing. Instead, I pulled the curtain closed and hunkered down with my friends. We passed out not long after we got into the house. We never went out to those bunkers again. About two years ago, I was driving home from a family reunion party pretty late at night. The drive itself was about two hours. I didn't stay the night because I had to be back for work the following day. Most of the drive was on roads with dense bushes and trees on either side. The real creepy ones that you see in a lot of movies. I've been driving for about 45 minutes and I start to get really tired. You know how sometimes you suddenly become really tired out of nowhere? Well, yeah, that happened to me and I knew I wasn't gonna last, but I didn't come across any place I felt like I could park and safely sleep. After a while, it became clear to me that I wasn't gonna find a place to pull up. My tiredness was just not going away. I did something very questionable. 
I pulled over to the side of the road onto the grass, behind these bushes, try to hide my car from anybody else who was going to come past. The roads weren't empty. I came across another car every few minutes or so. I made a mental note to myself. The time was 11.22, and then fell asleep. This was by no means routine behavior for me. I honestly was just exhausted. Didn't feel tripped up by the area. It was rural enough that there wouldn't be anyone out in the woods, and the road was trafficked enough that I wasn't truly alone. Other commuters were drifting by, which would make it hard for someone to creep up on my car. At least, that was my logic. Sometime later, I was awoken by a scratching sound. I looked at the clock. 11.50. The sound stopped a few seconds later, and because I was still extremely tired, I didn't really bother looking around and simply went back to sleep. Barely a half hour had gone by, and I'd only really started falling asleep. I wanted at least an hour's worth of rest before I hit the road again, so I closed my eyes and tried to forget about the noise. I was later woken by that same sound. It was now 12.40. It scared me for some reason when I saw the time. I really didn't feel like an hour had gone by, yet there it was, the reality glowing back at me. For whatever the reason was, that amount of time that had gone by made me feel even more vulnerable. This time it really freaked me out because the sound did not stop. The thought ran across my mind that it was an animal inspecting my car, but why would it return almost an hour after it left the previous time? I looked in my rearview mirror, just managed to catch a glimpse of something running away into the forest. At the time, I thought it was a hook killer. You know, the one that scratches the couple's car and slaughters the guy when he got out to investigate. Hell no, I thought to myself, I'm gonna get out of here. There was a bend no more than 100 yards up the road. As it came around, there was a car, parked off to the side of the road with a driver's side door open. I slowed down just to look to see if anyone was in there, and there wasn't. I let the car roll to a stop right next to that open door. This was just beyond weird. It felt like I was in a dream or something. I actually considered trying to do something crazy just to see if I was dreaming. The inside of the car was dark, washed only with moonlight. It occurred to me that someone clicked the dome light off to keep the car somewhat hidden. It also occurred to me because I was doing something similar when I tucked in my car behind the bushes. Whoever that person was, they didn't want to be seen. I don't know why, but I put my car in park and got out to take a look. It might have been because of the dream thoughts that were still in my head, but for whatever reason, I was more curious about whatever was going on. Any other reasonable person wouldn't have abandoned their safety in a situation like that, but I was looking for answers. The situation was too weird not to. I walked around to inspect the driver's seat. The car is somewhat kempt, a little trash in the front and back. It looks like your average person's daily driver. In the back, I see a duffel bag, moderately packed, zipped with a small padlock. This seems like a long distance traveler to me. You don't see people locking their luggage much otherwise. Also inside the back seat, a coat hanger that had been straightened into this weird twisted form. Only after I see that wire does everything truly come into my head and I realize just how dangerous this situation is. I turn to jump back into my car, but something catches my eye in the front seat, something glistening all over the front steering wheel. I lean over and nearly vomit when I realize what I'm looking at is a certain bodily fluid that happens after you do a certain act. Some weirdo was self-servicing out here in a country highway. Yep, definitely time to get out of here. I jog around to the driver's side of my car, jump in and slam that thing in drive. Forget the rest, forget the exhaustion, I can't be here. The car starts to glide forward as I make my escape. Then I look in my rear view mirror. At first I didn't see anything, but then all of a sudden, this guy comes sprinting around the bend of the road. He looks insane, deranged, with these big white eyes bugging out of his head. He looked embarrassed and kind of surprised. He must have been lurking around when my car was originally parked. Maybe he dozed off or something, and when he woke up, I pulled away to find his car just up ahead. Whatever the case, the guy was just barreling right for me. In the red reflection of my brake lights, he looked absolutely terrifying like he was possessed by a demon or something. 
Even his teeth were rinsed in this crimson color. He starts screaming at me, shouting like, Hey! Hey you! Get the hell out of your car, now! I just sat there in shock, unsure of what to do. He keeps screaming which finally snaps me out of my stupor. I sped down the road. It was just in the nick of time too, because that guy was inches from touching my back bumper. Without missing a beat, he jumped inside his car, fires up the engine and starts chasing me down the road. Not good. Actually, I was totally unprepared for this. I'm not really an overly confident driver, and my car is not a speedster by any sense of the word. I look into my mirror again, just in time to see the psycho turn his headlights off, his black sedan simply vanishing in the darkness behind me. I let my speedometer hit 75. I don't want to do anything too crazy. We're still in the woods. There's animals and other cars potentially I could crash into. This guy would definitely catch me if I jam my car up for any reason. Still, I couldn't tell if I was making distance or not. I kept my eyes divided between the road and the rearview mirror. He wasn't there though. Something caught my eye in my periphery and I looked outside my window to see his car now parallel with mine. He was staring at me, giving me this insane smile. He gestures down to the steering wheel and the coating he gave it, as if he wants to know what I think. He shows me a screwdriver in his free hand, all 10 inches of it. He makes a motion as if he were trying to get my door open with it back when I was parked. Thankfully, some headlights cut through the dark up ahead. There's an oncoming car shooting right for this crazy guy. He's forced to brake and get behind me. The oncoming car slows down a bit, as if it's seen him squirreling all over the road. Now there are witnesses, so I flash my headlights and try to communicate that something is wrong. This totally spooks the guy. He turns off the highway and starts cutting back into the woodland. He was driving this pretty average sedan, now definitely outfitted for four-wheeling. This guy was desperate to hide. Whatever he was up to, I wanted no part of it, and I learned my lesson. I'll never sleep on the side of the road ever again. This is not supernaturally creepy, but one of the more disturbing and surreal experiences of my entire life. One early morning, a few short years ago, I was walking to my bus stop eating a banana. It's dark and misty, around 5 a.m., and I'm internally debating something trivial, like if I want my daily Starbucks before or after my commute. It was a walk I'd made a million times, not particularly far distance and not anywhere dangerous by any means. My worst fear was getting jumped by a dog. I'd heard a story about a woman walking home from the store when I was a kid, and she was snacking on something she'd bought as she strolled along. Well, a mangy dog got a whiff of whatever she was eating, came out of an alley and started tailing her down the street. The lady had no idea, so next time she let the hand fall to her side and it was holding that treat, the dog jumped up and bit two of her fingers off. And they never caught that dog, so they were never able to reattach her fingers. The whole thing was so crazy to my child brain, it became a deep-rooted paranoia for many, many years. That being said, I knew my block well, and there weren't any dogs that lived on this end. As long as I kept an eye out for the strays, I was in the clear, so I let my guard down more than I may have otherwise. As I approached the dimly lit corner of my street, a tall man in a black mask steps out of the dark alleyway to my left. Sleepy and disoriented, I barely even acknowledge him. I'm a bit of an introverted person, so it's not uncommon for me to not acknowledge people even slightly. It's rude, but it's my personality type, and frankly, it's 5 a.m. I don't need to greet you with a smile. Still, there's an energy I start to feel as I walk past. I couldn't put my finger on what it was, but that was because I wasn't looking at him. Since I was a foot between this guy and already catching weird vibes, I decided to not chance it and look up for my banana. As I'm deciding to do this, the guy yells for me to freeze and don't run, all kinds of weird stuff. Out of the edge of my periphery, I can see him pull a gun out of his pocket. I don't need to look up now to know the barrel is aimed right at the side of my head. The guy lets the cold steel bounce off my forehead and tells me to put the bags down. 
I say, okay, okay, I'm putting them right down over here. I was carrying a small duffel and a messenger bag. Just trying to place them more on the curb to create a little distance between myself and that gun. I was still processing exactly what was going on. Still really not in the moment. Part of it may just be shock. Maybe that's how we all feel when we're looking down a barrel though. He shakes his head and lunges for me. Really showing how aggressive he is. There's no way to create any distance so I stop moving and nod along. He orders me to walk over to him into the opening of the alley that he just came out of. I step over, but I'm still in the street. Now he tells me to get on the ground, to which I agree. My heart is pounding a million miles a minute against that concrete. All I can smell is the banana in my hands and my mouth. It's a scary but soothing combination. I know I need to make a break for it the second I have an opportunity. I don't know why, but my mouth just won't stop working. Look, see, I'm on the ground. My stuff is over there. Please just take my stuff. He doesn't like it. Shut up. Let me think. He gets on top of me and puts the gun to my head. As I do this, I realize that this guy isn't a career criminal. In fact, this might be his first time. He needs a moment to think? Are you kidding me? Without any other options, though, I nod and try not to blab too much. At this point, I should mention the fact that I'm on my way to coach a high school practice. I'm dressed like a dude. Huge baggy pants, hat, jacket. If not for my telltale voice, I'd look like a pubescent 90s rap star. Anyway, this guy gets on top of me, gun to my head, looks at me and then pauses. I can't tell you why I know this, but I swear at the moment, it clicks for him that I'm actually a woman. He gives me this disgusting smile and starts to nod. What do we got here? I like that voice of yours, he says. Everything about this guy has now changed, even the way he's handling the gun. He was apparently threatened by me before, thinking I was a dude. Now he's easygoing, charming, trying to be slick. I won't go too deep into it, but his hands wandered for a bit, trying to get me figured out underneath my clothes. He gets off me, stands up, and then points to the dark alley. Come with me, is all he says. My stomach hurts. I remember that there's been a bunch of sexual assaults in my neighborhood, and during the daytime no less. When the man points down that dirty alleyway, my internal voice speaks up. Voice number one, there's no way in hell you're going to go down there without a fight. But he has a gun, you idiot, replies voice number two. Get up. The real voice, his voice, hollers. It snaps me out of my trance, just laying there hugging that sidewalk for whatever security it might lend me. Staring down the alleyway, I was happy to lay on that ground. The voices in my head stopped trying to offer advice, so I was left with my own logic. The alley wasn't an option. I let him shoot me with every bullet before I went down there. I ran a few quick scenarios through my head, but nothing really made sense. There was no cover, nowhere to hide, no one to call out to. The guy is getting a little manic again, fidgeting between myself and the alley, looking back and forth. I'm on, he says again. That's when it comes to me. I'll do what I do best. Talk. I'm coming. I'm following you, I called. And the man makes a crucial mistake. He believes me. I take one, two tiny steps backwards towards that sidewalk. He turns his body and his gun toward the alley. This is my moment. I take a deep breath, tuck my head down in case he starts shooting, and start sprinting away. I hear a voice screaming in a high-pitched wail before I realize that it's me. After running six or seven blocks, I head back to my apartment, hoping he's not there to see where I actually lived. The police checked out that alleyway an hour later, but the potential attacker was long gone. The only evidence of the encounter is my banana peel browning in the alleyway and the adrenaline rush that couldn't shake for days. I would be lying if I said that experience doesn't bother me still, but I'm so fortunate, mainly to be haunted by the what ifs and not the what dids. Thankfully, I had a job that was understanding. No one razzed me about missing practice or showing up late. Strings of attacks kept on in my neighborhood for another couple of months until one day, 
I saw a headline in the paper. The story about that attacker, the history of assaults, and the general area of the crimes. There was a picture right beside the text. It was the same guy that jammed me up that foggy morning. He looked like he didn't have a care in the world, which was honestly one of the scariest things for me. You could tell the man was heartless when you looked at him. God knows what he would have done if I actually listened. Every time I stay at my grandma's house, I hear someone walking upstairs. It starts at one end of the room, casually walks to the other, and then stops. This happens maybe twice a night. I didn't start hearing it until I was 14. My grandmother made me start sleeping in a different room on the first floor because they started sleeping in a separate bedroom. Either way, both of the rooms are on the first floor. That being said, their old original master bedroom is on the second floor and is the only bedroom upstairs. Now it serves as a glorified guest room and the general storage for the grandparents. It's beautiful with all kinds of collector decor, antiques, I'm sure you get the picture. Just for a little backstory, I've always been afraid of the upstairs at their house. I really don't know why, but it's just always freaked me out. I refuse to ever go up there alone. I'm 23 now, still won't go up there by myself. There's one room specifically though. It's a long, narrow bedroom. When you open up the door, there are closets on your left and your right, and a bed placed roughly in the middle of the room, and a window on the far side opposite the door. I was told growing up, by my grandparents that the sons of the previous owner claimed to see a gorilla come out of the closet at night, dance around the room, and then go back inside the closet. Obviously, I didn't really think much of this story until I had to start sleeping in the other room, the room located directly below the scary room upstairs. I mean, seriously, what a truly unique story to hear. The story would have been back around the turn of the century, early 1900s, so a gorilla was such an odd claim for these children. Of all the things, why that? What could be so overwhelming that these kids thought that they were looking at a big ape dancing around the room? It always stuck out in my head though. Obviously, there aren't any answers to be found. It's just something we heard growing up. So I didn't really think much about it until I started sleeping under their old room. That's when all this craziness started to go down. Now to the story. We're hanging out at the grandparents' house a very busy day of visiting. It's gotten late. We're all starting to turn in for bed. All the lights in the house are off. I'm still awake though, lying in bed. That's when I hear it. Thump, thump, thump. Starting at one end of the room upstairs. It got close to me, passed right above me, and then continued to the other end of the room. Then it stopped. I'm wide awake, terrified out of my mind. It was no question to me that I heard those footsteps. I knew that slow, casual pace. I was freaked out. I went to my grandpa's room, told him what I heard, and he told me that the house is old. It creaks and moans. But he turned the dining room light on for me, so it made me feel a little safer. I tried to go back to sleep. It started up not long after that, this time from where it ended the first time, by the window upstairs. It walked over me again and stopped when it reached the door. I thought it was over until five seconds later. I hear it coming down the stairs. One, two, three, four, five. Silence as it reached the landing. Then six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Silence again as it reached the first floor. I was frozen in shock. Whatever it was, it was now on my floor of the house and sadly unaffected by the dining room light. I was staring at the doorway to my room, with the dining light room shining in. My vision began to distort. I felt so dizzy with fear that I pulled the blankets up over my head, and suddenly I heard a scratching sound from inside my room. I knew exactly where it was coming from too, my grandpa's gun case. It was a very obvious sound, scratching on the wood, long scratches down the front of the gun case door. I could even hear the door ever so slightly tapping against the frame as each scratch began. 
I tried to scream to get someone's attention, but nothing even came out of my mouth. I took a deep breath and tried again. This time, a shriek rips out of my lungs. In seconds, my grandpa had made it to my room and was asking what the hell is going on. I explained everything, how I heard the steps, heard them come down the stairs, creep down the hall, and finally, scratch the gun case. I tried to space out the timeline so we understood that this didn't happen all at once. It was something that's slowly moving from room to room. Needless to say, he didn't believe me, so I did what any normal person would do. I draped the sheet over the side of the bed and slept underneath the mattress. I wrapped myself in a tight comforter and put on headphones, turned my back to the door. There could be a party of ghosts in my room, I wouldn't even know. It was actually pretty cozy underneath the bed, as there was a good clearance and nothing else was under there, so I just zoned out until I fell asleep. The next morning, my grandpa told my grandma about what happened the night before. And she just said, Oh, that's silly. You know your cousin woke me up the last time she stayed here. She came in my room saying that she heard footsteps too. I take a shaky breath. Then my grandpa and I shared a look. He makes a comment about how my grandma never mentioned that to him. She says she didn't find it important at the time. It's an old creaky house. Of course there's noises. With more information on the table, I can tell that grandpa is now a little shaken up himself. Still, they come to the conclusion that they've lived there a long time and they've never experienced anything like it. I slept under the bed for the whole rest of that trip. I've stayed there countless times since that happened. I hear footsteps every single time. I sleep on top of the bed now, but keep my back to the door and sleep with headphones on, at least until one specific trip. One summer, my cousins and I stay with my grandparents like usual. One night, as we're playing a particularly heated game of Scrabble, the evening just got away from us. The game ended and we realized it was well after midnight, past the time most of us went to bed. We hugged, said our goodnights, and everyone turned in. Because of the hour and the distraction of playing Scrabble, I kind of forgot about my sleeping routine. Since my cousins were visiting too and sleeping on the couch, I wasn't concerned about the creepy stuff. I crawled into bed without the comforter shield or my headphones, started to drift off. Just as I'm about to pass out, I hear the first of several thumps. I don't even open my eyes. I felt like I betrayed myself and didn't feel like getting up and getting my stuff together. I wanted to power through, sleep like a normal person, so I just rolled the dice and stayed inside the bed. I listened to the thumping for probably 45 minutes. It stayed in the room above mine, but after a while, it ventured into other parts of the second floor. At times, it was so far from the part of the house that I could barely hear it. Part of me was a little excited. As I thought maybe my grandpa would finally hear it himself. The weight of those steps was not subtle, not even in the slightest. Full weight with each and every step. If they trounced overhead for even 10 seconds, they'd wake anybody up. Sure enough, at the one hour mark, my bedroom door slowly creaked open. I sat up rigid and wide-eyed, expecting to see that gorilla step into my room. It's not an ape though, but my older cousin, she has that same crazy expression that I do and asked me if I heard that, to which I almost start to laugh and wave her over to the bed. We discussed it for a minute, mostly how long we've been hearing those sounds and what it might actually be. Then we got into the history of it, how long the footsteps have been going on for. I thought I had the most experience, but it turned out my cousin had me beat. Her first night dealing with it was more than 10 years ago, whereas mine was only four or five. Just as we're talking and comparing our notes, the thumping comes back over to my bedroom. We freeze. It was the first time I ever heard it in the company of another person, and frankly, it made it even worse. When you're alone and you hear a noise like that, it's much easier to write it off as wind or board settling in. Having someone next to me confirming every step made me spiral. As we listened though, it had the opposite effect on my cousin. I mean, I can't lie. She was scared shitless at first, just like I was, but it only took a minute and then she was fired up. She kicked the covers off of both of us, jumped up and started looking for a flashlight. 
There was one in the bedside table, but it was very close to dying. She didn't care. With one hand on the doorknob, she turned and asked if I was coming. Slowly, without any confidence, I slid out of bed and went down the hall with her. Just as we started to move into the kitchen, the thumping upstairs seemed to follow. Sure enough, the steps started down the staircase. All three of us would hit the landing at the same time by the sound of it. My cousin squared up, then literally ran around the corner and shone the light up the stairs. I watched her eyes go wide and her face go blank. She didn't like whatever was up there. I came around the corner, but there was nothing there. Just the flickering light from the flashlight. My cousin said when she first looked up there, she saw pale white feet and a linen gown. Then they disappeared up the stairs. I begged her to go wake up our grandparents, but she refused. We've been waking him up on every visit for a decade. Now that she had some backup, she wanted to get to the bottom of the thumping once and for all. As we climbed, we could hear it shuffling deeper into the second room, moving between room and room. I'd never heard it up here. The steps didn't sound as heavy, almost hollow now. The flashlight went totally dark for a minute, and I almost pissed my pants. I mean, literally. I couldn't believe how dark it was. When the light came back, though, I saw what my cousin was talking about. A figure in a gown, shuffling around the corner. We both jumped and screamed, but we jumped in opposite directions. She went toward the room it went into, and I went back towards the stairs. At this point, I'm screaming for my grandpa to please wake up. My cousin snatches my wrist, drags me towards the guest room that that figure is in. The light is failing badly, but she's hell-bent. We get to the threshold and peek in. For the first time, the bulb gives us some solid illumination. There's a gowned figure, standing in the middle of the bed. The person is like a full four feet above us, with their back to the door. It looks like a woman at first, but I honestly can't tell. Whoever it is, they're humming to themselves, gently swaying in the dark. My cousin takes another step forward, just as Grandpa steps into the room and flicks the light on. That's when everything comes together. The person that we see on the bed is my grandma. She's been totally out of it. It turned out she'd been sleepwalking for a number of years, maybe even longer than that. She would get out of bed in the middle of the night, go to her old bedroom and relive memories or whatever. Apparently it's pretty common. Either way, it scared the hell out of all of us that night, even my grandma. My cousin to this day isn't totally convinced. Like I said, she heard the steps 10 years prior before they even started sleeping in a different room. She thinks grandma sleepwalking just overlapped with something else. Whatever the case is, we all make sure to visit together 